Hello there everybody, Sam Strange here, welcome back to the railway and welcome back to another review. Up to date I have yet another large Hornby steam locomotive. Today's locomotive is an A4, and of course I have looked at A4s before, but today's A4 is very much unlike any of the others I've looked at in the past. So it is this, it is the Hornby Walter K. Wiggum locomotive in what they call the BR Experimental Purple livery, which is a super strange livery, as you can see here. I'm not even certain whether or not I like this livery, I've never been able to decide. Hopefully when we get this model out and take a look at it, we'll be able to decide together whether or not <laughs> this is a livery we like. I will post a poll on the community tab as well so that you can let me know is this a nice livery or not in your opinion do let me know anyway this has an rrp of 169 pounds 99 which i think is actually quite a lot of money i mean the drawing on the box is dated 2004 and if that's anything to go by then this model is quite closely approaching 20 years old and i think 170 pounds for a nearly 20 year old model does seem a little bit steep however i paid 130 pounds for mine which is obviously quite a lot better but even so this loco will have to be a big improvement over the let's say the flying scotsman i looked at not too long ago which did have quite a few quality problems however provided we like the livery i guess and provided it is put together properly and it arrived with me in good condition i think this ought to do quite well today because we know the Hornby A4s are pretty decent. So if you want to check out the other A4s in Hornby's range I have got affiliate links to Hattons down in the description so check those out if you'd like. For now though let's get this out and see if it's any good. Yes, the BR Experimental Purple. It's a very, very strange one, this. I mean, the sources that I've seen online said that even though this was called purple, in real life, the livery was more of a blue. I don't know whether I believe that or not. However, this model is definitely more of a purple, so who's right? I'm not entirely sure. Ultimately, this livery hasn't been seen for many, many years, as far as I know, so <laughs> I suppose it's quite difficult to find out these things now. Anyway, let me show you the end of the box in case you were interested in the version I have. So it's r 370 one. It's a BR Class A4, as you know, Walter Kate Wiggum. I didn't, I should have looked up who that was, actually. Uh, I apologise for my ignorance on that. And it is number 60028. So that's the running number of this version, as you can see. And yet, you can tell that this is an early British Railways livery. It doesn't even have the BR crest. In fact, I think this happened right around the time of nationalisation, if I've understood that correctly. Okay, let me show you the back of the box. So this was classified as an 8P as well as an A4. So they were very powerful machines as we know. In the centre of the box there you have a brief history of the, well it's not brief, again there's very few brief histories out there these days, they're all quite involved but that's great so feel free to pause and read that if you like. And then on the far end there's that famous diagram I talked about and yes it is dated 2004. I don't know whether or not the model has seen any updates since then, I don't think I have a one that was produced around the 2004 time so I'm not entirely sure. I can tell that the model on the front of the box has the sort of hideous unpaid painted axles which stand out. I'm pretty sure the other A4s that I've looked at recently didn't have that. I think they were at least painted over, but we shall find out. Okay, <laughs> that was an oddly specific thing to point out, wasn't it? All right, here it is. Ooh. Now, I haven't had this out of the box before, yet someone has turned around the block of ice packaging. Hmm. I don't know if the retailer did that then, but there it is. And you know what? That does now look more of a blue than a purple, doesn't it? The box, let's see if we can get this in without the, the lighting messing it up. The box is more purpley than the loco itself, I think. I'm not very good with colour. I'm not colour blind or anything, but yeah, I just, I, I struggle to describe colour for some reason. Uh, but yeah, well, I guess we'll just have to see, won't we, when we get it out. Goodness knows whether or not the camera is going to do a good job of uh, displaying the colour accurately. I think it does a fairly good job, though. It has done in the past. Okay, so there is the locomotive. Yep, it feels like the standard, fairly heavy Hornby A4. I'll do the usual weighing and everything in just a second. Let's have a quick look at the operating and maintenance instructions, just to jog our memory on that so there we go the front is obviously just the standard guff and then inside yep lubrication points body removal yeah, it's quite fiddly this one at least they do talk about the speedo assembly though some of hornby's instruction manuals neglect to mention that which means if you try to disassemble the loco as instructed on the paperwork 
you will pull that speedo off and damage it. So thank goodness they've talked about that. And then this loco is indeed DCC ready with the decoder in the tender, which is pretty modern and decent. And then on the back, brake rods fitting, although I think they're already fitted to the model, aren't they? Let's have a look. Yes, they are. <laughs> but I guess if you ever needed to remove them and then weren't sure how to put them back on, maybe this would help. Uh, no, I don't think it would actually, would it? Never mind. It's irrelevant and pointless to mention. Okay, shall we have a look at this then? I'm really looking forward to this one. I, I don't know whether I'm going to enjoy this. I will, I'll say that yet again, just to reiterate. I'm not sure if this is a livery I'm going to like or not. Even now, even now I can see the thing. Anyway, we have an accessories bag here, which is quite involved. So as you can see, we have painted cylinder drain cocks, which you can fit to the model if you wish. There is a flanged axle there, which goes on the pony truck. Again, though, that's only going to be suitable for sort of display purposes or on layouts that have seriously realistic curves. Uh, but yeah, that's quite a nice inclusion, isn't it? And then it looks like we've got some vacuum pipes, perhaps. Yeah. And that's about it and there's some paperwork inside there which shows how to fit that presumably right come on then I'm, I'm just interested now to see whether or not this is actually a loco i'm going to enjoy okay wow this is pretty heavy i do i have owned a force before but do you know what mm, that livery it's very unusual and I, I know for a fact that people are not going to like this there will be some people that think this looks gross but you know, I'm leaning the other way with this. I think this actually looks really quite nice in person. It didn't look particularly good in the pictures, did it? But no, I, I think that's all right, that. I'd hate to choose between this and the standard liveries. I think I would probably go for the garter blues and stuff instead, or perhaps the BR blues. But for what this is, I think this looks absolutely fine, doesn't it? And the quality seems all right. I mean, the buffer beams are stuck to the model, which is good. I can see the metal rod there underneath the cab. That is still fitted to the model. So yeah, hopefully we'll have a good time with this today. Anyway, we'll take a close look at this in just a second, but first up, here's some history of the A4s. So the A4s were a class of l &E Pacifics designed by Sir Nigel Gresley, and they were introduced back in 1935. The first locomotive was Silverlink, and it literally broke all speed records during its first ever run. The A4s were made most famous by Mallard, of course, though, which is also known as the world's fastest steam locomotive, which achieved that title in 1938 at 126 miles per hour. The A4s were based on the Class A1, which we've looked at in the past, which was obviously also a Gresley design, but it was produced around 15 years previously, so the A4 is a kind of much newer version of the design. 35 A4s were built in total, and Mallard, along with five other members of the class, were preserved. All members of the class retained their streamlining permanently, unlike other classes, the Coronation, for instance, or perhaps if you want to call the, the Battle of Britain locomotive streamlined, which eventually had it removed. The purple livery was very short-lived, it was experimental, as I say, and it came about when four of the A4s wore the livery after nationalisation, and they, like I say, they called the colour purple, but it was supposedly more similar to a blue, and I think the one that comes up quite a lot is the GER blue, so supposedly it looks like that, but I'm not sure if that's true. Okay, so there it is up close and personal for you then, the Humby A4 in the very bizarre BR Experimental Purple. And you know what? This is kind of growing on me, I think. I wasn't sure at the start. Now that I've had a good chance to look at it, I'm getting used to it a little bit more. I would say that I quite like this livery. Yes, it's pretty cool. And the model is pretty quality as well, it must be said. I'm really quite pleasantly surprised by how well this is put together. Does the model justify the £169.99 RRP? No, I'm, I'm not really convinced about that. I mean, this is an old model. It's been in Hornby's range for a number of years. It's been a popular model, so the tooling costs should have been covered long, long ago. And it's also, you know, it's an A4. The streamlining covers up a lot of the traditional complexities in a steam locomotive, which means that they haven't had to be modelled. So no, I can't see why this would need to be quite as expensive. However, it must be said there are a number of really nice features on this model, and we're going to get to some of those right now. So the decoration is excellent, it must be said. This does suffer from the plasticky finish that the Flying Scotsman did. Uh, however, I think the sort of more matte finish on this model does suit the livery a little bit more than perhaps the BR Blue did. Maybe I'm wrong about that, and obviously it's probably 
not realistic either way because these things were shiny in real life. However, besides the actual finish of the bodywork, the lining is absolutely perfect and that's quite glossy actually. The finish on the pinstriping does have a bit of a, a sort of satin finish, which is quite unusual. I don't think that's as it would have been in real life, but it's all right, I suppose. It's fair enough. The side of the cab has got the lining as well as the running number, classification, route availability, etc. And then you've got a real nice bit of lining going on along what I will call the foot plate. I don't know whether that, yes, I suppose it would be the foot plate, wouldn't it? Anyway, you can see that the foot plate or whatever it is has quite an irregular shape. And so the fact that the lining is so precise on there is quite impressive to me, I think. The name plates are separately fitted, but they are unfortunately not etched. Again, that's a little bit baffling, isn't it, considering how much this model cost. So they do look a little bit plasticky when you look at them up close. However, many of the details fitted to this locomotive are actually made of metal, and that makes a big difference, I think. So you've got what I assume is the reversing rod here. That is quite a large metal piece, separately fitted, of course. The safety valves, which are set down into the top of the cab roof, as you can see, they are clearly made of sort of a brass or a copper, aren't they? Because they have a real metallic shine. Same thing with the whistle as well. I mean, that is clearly not made of plastic, is it? And that makes a huge difference when you look at this model. Little things like that, and I, I don't think they can cost an awful lot, but they really do create the illusion of realism, don't they? And not to mention quality, of course. So I'm pretty glad to see that. Along the sides of the body, we have the very fine separately fitted handrails. And on the left-hand side here, we also have the pipe, which goes across the length of the streamlining. The streamlined front has the number board here, as well as the separately fitted lamp brackets. The buffer beams are complete with screw link couplings, which I think is quite impressive. And we do have separately fitted metal sprung buffers as well. So by no means is this model basic. I mean, I keep saying this might have been made in 2004. Well, even if that's true, the fact is the level of detail and some of the features on this locomotive are easily up to modern standards, aren't they? And if this model was a new release this year, I might complain about the price, but I don't think I'd be complaining too much about the level of detail. I can't really think of any way that this could be improved, at least not from my perspective. So let's take a look at the cab. I mean, the top of the cab has the separately fitted opening air intakes, as you can see. So if I open up those, we should get a little bit more light into the cab so we can look at some of the details inside there. Before we do, I will show you some of the glazing. As you can see, we've got nice flush glazing fitted to the cab, which looks pretty decent. The cab is pre-fitted with cab doors, as you can see, as well as a separately fitted tender fall plate, which I believe is made of metal but it isn't poseable so it's stuck in that sort of awkward <laughs> two o'clock position or something which is obviously not dreadfully realistic however the interior of the cab is really really impressive not only is all of the pipe work and the controls picked out with the paintwork you've also got paintwork on the gauges and dials as well that is ultra ultra fine a fantastic level of detail inside the cab. I really, really love that. And as you can see, the wheel set looks pretty decent as well. I believe these are plastic molded wheels. We do have the axles poking through, so the wheel centers are not part of the molding there, but they have been painted black, which is pretty decent. And as you can see, the running gear, the coupling rods, connecting rods, etc., etc., those are all quite nice and fine, and they seem to be in fairly good shape as well. I've heard some people say that they've had A4s arrive with all bent up coupling rods and valve gear. No, this one seems fine actually, so I'm pretty pleased about that. Let's take a look at the tender. I mean, again, the decoration is very good on the tender. The lining looks absolutely fine to my relatively untrained eye in these things. And of course, you've got the early British Railways lettering on the side there. The coal load is removable, as we saw in the instructions, and it's also very fine as well. I do like some of the detail in the coal load there. It looks very good and realistic. The underframe looks pretty decent, particularly with the brake rigging pre-fitted. I quite like that. And as you can see, all of the suspension springs and the axle boxes are nicely moulded on there. This is the corridor tender, as you can tell, because it's got the corridor connection on the back, which is pretty good. If you look closely at the little porthole on the back there, there is a bit of dodgy moulding going on there. I don't know if that's a sign that the tooling is perhaps getting a little bit old. But yeah, that window wasn't perfectly formed, was it? But I mean, that's the only thing that really doesn't look all that good to me. Maybe some of the cab doors look a little little bit nippy and maybe some of the opening cab air intake things look a little bit choppy but yeah overall it's quite a nicely rendered model isn't it and of course we do have the NEM coupling on the back the tension lock one although I don't believe there's any way of fitting a NEM coupling to the front of the locomotive I suppose the streamlining makes that quite difficult and the front bogey does not have a NEM pocket on it as far as I'm aware okay so there we go that is a brief overview of some of the details yeah it's really really decent isn't it when this came out if it did come out in sort of 2004 2005 if it came out in this state 
with this level of detail, it must have been a really, really impressive model. So on that note, we'll take a look at the mechanism, get it down onto the track and find out how this beautiful locomotive runs. All right, so there's Walter down onto the track, ready for his first ever test. Yes, this will be the first ever run. First of all, let's talk a little bit about the mechanism and some of the other specs. Model weight, first of all, this weighs in at 398 grams. So it is, you know, it's reasonably hefty. That's about 10 grams heavier than the Flying Scotsman model I looked at. So it's a fair weight, but it's a little bit lighter than the A1 Tornado and the Princess Royal and other sort of more modern Hornby Pacifics. But overall, the weight isn't a huge problem. The Loco does have tender pickups as well as pickups pickups on the driving wheels so you have three sets of pickups on each rail in the loco and then four on the tender although puzzlingly the second wheel set on the tender does not touch the track I noticed this when we had it up on the white background during the detail section um, yeah your guess is as good as mine there maybe is that another sign that the tooling is maybe past its prime I'm not entirely sure but I would have thought all wheels on the track would be a fairly basic requirement so it's a pity about that now the base keeper plate on the locomotive is sort of hardwired on with the pickups on it so I'm not going to try and get that off again and show you the bearings and such it does have proper turned metal bearings on each driving axle and it has pickups as I say going to each driving wheel so that's fine underneath the hood there is the chassis it's a nice neat and tidy chassis again all the wires and such are held in place with tape which I suppose is fair enough there is the motor it's a five pole motor no flywheel or anything though which is a bit of a pity but that's probably the only criticism I would have and very interesting now that the body's off if we look inside the body you can see that it was molded in the garter blue color it wasn't actually molded in this purple slash blue color at all it's actually been painted into that color which I thought was quite interesting and then finally the gauging was also very interesting this is the only model I've measured where the back-to-back -back gauge was below what the standard sets and not above it uh, so yeah the back-to-back -back was 14.3 millimeters that's only 0.1 millimeters too loose so I'm hoping it won't cause much of a problem and the front to back was fine so no issues there for now though let's get this model tested and I'm going to set this forwards bear in mind it has not yet been run in so don't expect the model to be at its best right now but out of the box here we go let's see how it goes does it work at all? <laughs> I'm turning it up. Hopefully it will. Oh. There we go. It started. I had to turn it quite a lot, actually, before the thing would start. But hopefully it will loosen up and become a lot better once it's had a chance to run in. Let's try it at 50% speed. Well, that seems all right. It's nice and smooth. In fact, cutting the power shows that it does have a bit of a flywheel effect even though there's no flywheel fitted. So maybe that's just because the motors are such beefy things that the armatures weigh quite a bit. I don't know. Maybe that's why they don't fit flywheels onto these. All right, so at the moment, it looks like it's a little bit unbalanced. Maybe there's an issue with the quartering. That's what some people say when a loco does this. I don't know about that. Maybe, maybe it's wrong to jump to conclusions before the thing has had a chance to run in. Backwards, it's going pretty slow. A little bit of cogging there. Oh, it has stuck now. Let's turn it up a bit more. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's performing very similar, actually, to the Flying Scotsman, isn't it? A little bit troublesome at the lower speeds. At least we know now that this is typical of these locos, and I'm not just showing you faulty ones. Anyway, let's charge forwards and back a little bit, and I'll try and get a bit of a crawl out of it forwards uh, before I run it in. And that gives us something to compare it to after the locos run in. I like doing this because then I've got kind of a record, haven't I, of exactly how a loco runs before and after running in. And then maybe one day we could actually compare all the footage I've collated and find out whether running in actually does make quite a difference. I think it does, though. Right, I think that should be enough of the charging back and forth. Let's bring it in and do a forwards crawl right now. So here we go. This is sort of semi-running, I guess. Go on, a bit more. Oh, oh, crikey. Seriously, is that all we're going to get? Let's try again. Maybe it was just on that tight spot again. Turning up gently. Oh, we've got a little movement, a bit more. So there we go. That's better. <laughs> it freaked me out then when it just lurched forwards. Oh, now it is lurching forwards. Now it's slowed down again. Oh, now it's speeding up again. All right, so quartering, I'm not sure, I, maybe I could in, in, incorporate a, a 
quartering test into my reviews. I'm not sure how I'd accurately measure it though. If anyone knows, let me know. Okay, well, yeah, it's not the best. Let's be honest, it's not the best. For 170 quid, I'd expect a better runner. Well, hopefully after running in, it will become that better runner, but only time will tell. And the time is 30 minutes in each direction, so off it goes. Like the Flying Scotsman though, which has a remarkably similar chassis, at the higher speeds, this Loco is running beautifully straight out of the box. So that's something to bear in mind. Fingers crossed though, the crawl will improve quite substantially after this running in period. So I will see you very, very shortly. Keep your fingers crossed and we'll see how it turns out. Okay folks, there we have it. Running in has concluded and that was absolutely fine. I didn't see any slowing down at different parts of the layout, no derailments or anything of that description. Yeah, it was a really, really good performer. The other thing that was noticeable as well is how competent the gearing is. Hornby sometimes are a little bit hit and miss on this, but it's actually very, very sensible on this model. I'm going to run it past you now at 50% speed. Here we go. As you can see, that is very moderate, isn't it? However, obviously that is only 50% speed and because these are the world's fastest steam locomotives, it is important that they can go speedy, but of course they can. You just turn them up to full speed and they can do that. Uh, yeah, the gearing is really, really good. It's a bit, I suppose, puzzling that it's not better at the slow speed, but maybe it will be. I think that's the big question. Is that slow speed performance going to be better? Well, I hope so. Let's give this a go. Here we go. Forwards. Oh, a bit more. All right, so that is still inching forwards. There's definitely a lot of cogging there. I, I would say that seems to be a little bit better, though. So running in does seem to have improved this. Ah, yes, but there we go. And it's still not very constant, is it? In fact, it's sped up quite a lot without me touching the controller there. Let's try it backwards. That's very strange. And what is even more strange is that my other older E4s don't do this. They're actually exemplary runners. They really are fantastic. And that's weird because obviously the Flying Scotsman I looked at behaved almost exactly as this one is doing now. So, you know, have Hornby done something different now? Are they using poorer quality motors or something? Or am I just unlucky? Well, I don't think I can be unlucky because that's two locos of a similar design that are behaving exactly the same. So, yeah. If only a few of them were like it, the chances of me coming across two in a row would be pretty slim, wouldn't they? But look at that. I'm not touching the controller now. That is really struggling. So yeah, quartering is something else binding. I'm not entirely sure. If you know how I can check the quartering sort of reliably and so I can quote a figure, uh, do let me know. But otherwise, yeah, it seems the slow speed sucks a little bit. Here we go. I'm not touching the controller. Fingers here. <laughs> look at that. And it stopped again. Well, it hasn't stopped, it's just getting past a, a tight spot. So yeah, that's not right. I mean, £130 I paid for this, uh, even at that discount, it ain't right. It ain't good enough. So yeah, that's a pity. It's a real pity about that. As I say, the high speed, absolutely fine. And we'll see how the thing handles coaches, because that is absolutely perfect. But it is the slower speeds that separates the good mechanisms from the bad mechanisms. Even the worst pile of junk runs all right at medium speed. Well, some of them do. Anyway, so I've set up seven coaches, as you can see. Seems like quite a load, but it's not really because these coaches have brand new AliExpress wheels that I'm eager to test. So let's see how Walter gets on with them. Can he haul seven coaches without taking much of a performance hit? Let's find out. All right, take it steady. Whoa. <laughs> Yeah, that seems to be binding a little bit worse than the Scotsman was. Hmm. Anyway, let's see if we can crawl off with the coaches. Is torque a problem? No, not really. Oh, seems to be handling those all right. So let's set that to say 40% speed so we can look at it over the curves and then I will speed it up later on to more of an A4 speed. Today's theme then is A4 locomotives and I have some others running for you in the running session, although see if you can spot an odd one out in the sidings. So this is, what's this one now? It's Golden Eagle, I think, in the BR Blue. And this one, again, this one is a much, much better runner than the Walter. I'm not sure why that is. Let me just try and do a little bit of a crawl. I know you're not at the perfect angle for it. But look, there's no cogging or anything going on there. And that is so much slower. Walter. 
Maybe Walter in a few years time after he's done hours and hours of running will become this good. Maybe that's a possibility, but there's certainly no binding or anything on this loco. And of course the strange thing is that on the Flying Scotsman I took him apart, I tried to find out whether there was anything binding. To the touch there was nothing binding at all, the wheel set was completely free to turn. So is it a motor and torque issue? I don't know. And then of course on the inside line the most famous of the A4 class, it is of course, where is she? Here we go, it's Mallard. Again this one's a much much better runner, let me come down to a bit of a crawl. And this is with coaches, don't forget. Look at that crawl. Perfectly, it's not quite as smooth as Golden Eagle actually. It's a bit newer than Golden Eagle, which might, I suppose, hint at the answer. But it's definitely much, much smoother than the one I've just reviewed. And again, none of the binding, it's perfectly constant through its rotation. Anyway, let's go and see how it's handling the coaches. Okay, here we go. This is only at 40 speed. And as you can see, absolutely no slowing down in the wheel set there at all, which is great. So it will get some points for that. There's obviously no issue with the torque, and it would seem as though that the slight under-gauging is not causing any problems, so that's good to see. Yeah, that's confusing because, again, it's just running beautifully at this slightly higher speed, isn't it? Yeah, maybe that's just the way they are now. But overall, yeah, it's nicely detailed. Let's have a little recap, shall we? It's nicely detailed, it looks fantastic. I do like the purple, I think that's great. The performance, it's not the best in the world, but I would say once you've got the coaches coupled and you're out of the yard, for example, and you're just running at any sort of speed, the performance is absolutely fine. It's not gonna be causing you problems. But obviously, if you like seeing your locos crawl, if you enjoy really seeing what a locomotive is capable of, then this one is definitely a little bit less impressive than some of the other models I've looked at in the past, even ones from Hornby. Um, so yeah, that's very, very strange. I mean, I'm not going to go into taking this to bits to find out whether there's something binding or not, because, I, like I say, I did that with the Scotsman, and I didn't find anything. I suppose you'll have to just check back in with me in five years or so. <laughs> and we'll find out whether it gets better. Although, then again, you shouldn't have to wait a number of years for your very expensive locomotives to start running their best. But we'll see, we'll see. We'll keep an eye on it, and if there is any change over the coming weeks, months, etc., then obviously I will update you and let you know. But yeah, it's fine, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, it is expensive, and perhaps it should have been better for the price, but overall, sure, if you want an A4, Hornby's in double O gauge is definitely your best option. Come on then, it's an A4, so we've got to max it out and find out what it's made of. Here we go, top speed, here it comes. Yep. <laughs> I would say that is rather speedy, to say the least. Look at that. I mean, that looks like 126 miles an hour. <laughs> Maybe I could do an experiment one day, find out exactly how fast that is, but as far as I'm concerned, that looks fast. That looks like an A4 at a speed. <laughs> so there you go, I mean you could argue that the high speed is more important than the slow speed where the A4s are concerned and if you do argue that then this is probably a much better model for you than it is for me. There you go, what a speed. Right, let's have some ratings then for the fairly impressive, actually, Hornby A4. The level of detail are given 4.5. Now, the level of detail really did impress me. The decoration was superb, and it's got quite a few specialist features, such as the metal details, sprung buffers, opening cab air intakes. Really, really good. I have had to knock half a star off because of the slightly plasticky looking finish and those plastic nameplates, which just don't look as good as the proper etched metal ones, or indeed the proper die cast bodies. I'm not gonna give a loco five stars with a finish like that however overall yet yeah, the level of detail fantastic the performance again i've just had to knock off a couple of stars it is absolutely fine it seems at the higher speeds and it's more than powerful etc etc it's just at that at the sort of lower half of the speed spectrum there is visible cogging and there does seem to be some sort of quartering or valve gear issue which is causing the loco not to run too smoothly and i think that is quite a, a fundamental flaw isn't it so it is going to lose two stars for that the pulling power is okay, it's pretty average I would say, 26 coaches, not as many as some, I do have some Pacifics that are much better pullers than this, however yeah the pulling power is absolutely fine. The mechanism generally speaking is really really good, I've given it 4 stars so you've got proper bearings on the wheel set, lots and lots of pickups including in the tender, 5 pole motor, no flywheel though, that is the one downside really and I think a flywheel would really have helped correct some of those cogging issues, so that's why it loses a star there. Next up the quality, I mean the quality was better than the flywheel 
Flying Scotsman I looked at, so I've given it an extra star there. However, it still misses out on five star in quality because of those sloppily molded parts, the cab doors, the opening air intakes, the porthole on the back of the tender. Yeah, there are some signs that the tooling is getting a little bit old and decrepit as some of my older A4s do not have those issues and also again the plastic construction means I can't give it five star but yeah not a major problem with the quality and value for money then three stars I've given it £169.99 is the RRP and it's down to 130 I paid 130 for it although other retailers are having to sell it even cheaper than that which speaks volumes doesn't it if the standard price was seen as you know a bargain or even great value I can't see why they would have to reduce them so much so yeah I mean the value for money is okay but the model ought to have been a little bit better didn't it for 170 pounds rrp particularly where the performance goes but it's not bad overall that's certainly not bad that's 7.30 out of 10 let's put that into the ranking there it is sixth just above the flying scotsman and below the backman web coal tank yes i think it's right that it's above scotsman because a lot of the quality issues that i found on the flying scotsman were not present on this model and i think that needs to be recognized but there we go yeah not a bad score at all and yes i do quite like the experimental purple that is something new that I've learned today. So that's it, the Hornby A4. Yeah, they're absolutely fine, aren't they? Absolutely fine. And if you want to check out the range of Hornby A4s or maybe even pick up one for yourself, I do have affiliate links down in the description. So click on those and you'll be taken to Hatton's and you'll see what's in stock. Personally, my recommendation might be, if you're not sort of desperate for an A4 now, might be just to wait, wait till January and see what Hornby come up with for their 2022 range. Because, I mean, this year they announced an upgraded A3 slash A1, and it sounds as though those are going to be quite the improvement over the old A1 and A3s. So maybe they'll do the same with the A4s. I'm not entirely sure what they could do. I mean, it's not as simple to give this one a sort of die-cast running plate. But maybe there are things that Hornby can do to improve this, and maybe that's what they have in the works. I've no insider knowledge. I mean, that could be complete nonsense, but... Yeah, if you're just thinking about it and you're not desperate, maybe it would be wise to just hold off for a little while and see what's in the next Hornby announcement. Yeah, I don't know. I'll be interested to see anyway. But as far as this one goes, yeah, it's fine. Again, probably should have been a little bit better for what it cost. But generally speaking, no major complaints. So, thank you very, very much for watching. As always, do let me know down in the comments what you thought about this. Is this something you would buy? If you own a Hornby A4, does it run like this one? Is it a little bit coggy at the slower speeds? Or is it like my BR Blue one and my Mallard? And does it run a bit better? Do let me know. I'd like to know what other people's experiences of these models are. For now, though, those are my thoughts. I could be right, I could be wrong. You let me know in the comments, I'm sure. Thank you for watching, though. I'll see you on the next one. Cheers, everybody.